and I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Nijoni Talis, who is uh, one of my former students and a graduating uh, senior who has done work in this region that is, uh, is first of all, collaborative um, and interdisciplinary, but also faces pressing issues in uh, Appalachia. Yacht Air, everyone. My name is Janine Tallis. Um, and so today I will be introducing, um, I'll be actually sharing my screen to share with you a presentation. Um, give me one second to present. Okay. Is everyone seeing that well? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so just to introduce like the, the concept of violence and how it comes into different forms of violence in terms of cultural, spiritual, um, the use of language as well, um, erasure has been really impactful on ind indigenous communities within the histories and within different forms of different forms it can take. And today I just wanted to discuss um, two examples of how I'm addressing those different violences that are happening to my own people, the Diné from the Upper Nation, and also just in general with the indigenous people and the histories um, we have to share. So in this case, um, the Navajo Nation and COVID-19, um, we all know that the pandemic has been taking a huge toll on the Navajo Nation and also other like indigenous people across the country and the world. And um, just back in like March, April of last year, we were one of the highest rate of infection within the US. Um, this was due to part like in the lack of resources, um, accessibility to running water and electricity um, is really causing the infection rate to go um, through the roof and also like having to stay at home um, where in most cases, a lot of people don't have access to go to the store because on another thing, the Napa Nation is a food desert. So just being, and just having those lack of resources um, has really impacted um, the Navajo Nation. So this past summer, uh, I was able to um, work with other um, community members and contribute to providing food boxes to combat this um, type of violence that is happening to the Navajo Nation and just resisting um, the amount of um, pain um, that is coming from the lack of resources and the hurt that the Navajo Nation um, is feeling and felt during this really hard time, um, especially if they couldn't leave their home. So um, I was able to share that with everybody. Um, and then along with that, I wanted to go into another example and just share like the relationship between archeology span and native peoples, which was what my project was focused on. and just sharing like how that is and how um, it relates to like native peoples and just sharing the histories of um, native peoples. And so just to share, um, my project was 10,000 years in Bent Mountain. And from here, I will change my screen to share my project briefly. Let me see, sorry. And then I'm just going to switch to my project. Okay, and so here's my project and it was just kind of discussing about um, the indigenous people uses of the land, um, but also like bringing to like how important it is to protect um, these different regions um, from the construction of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, that was going through the various um, areas across like Bent Mountain. And as you can see, um, the yellow line shows where the Mountain Valley and Pipeline will go through. And I just really wanted to um, learn more about how does archaeology play into um, the play into discussing histories of indigenous people. And especially like within this region, um, 
that's really close to like Virginia Tech and also to the Monacan people. So just going more into that, um, Bent Mountain is a natural area and commonly located like 31 miles south of Roanoke. And for thousands of years, um, it has been through colonization um, and resource has been extracted, people have moved, and in most cases, um, a lot of um, tribal people um, were taken off this land, were moved, and the present day um, indigenous people now, the Monacan, their ancestors' homelands were desecrated because of this um, colonization. And I know a lot of cases that this information or this history is not shared. And by doing this project, I was able to share that and how important it is to keep these um, sites um, protected from even more damage, from even more um, extractive um, measures and methods. So here's just an oversight of all the different items here. And then another just showcasing the before and after of um, the map from Jefferson 19, 1776 map and the different sites. Um, couldn't find a map that exactly overlaid, but just to show the general area. And then I went to look at the different archeological time periods um, from the Palo Indian to all the way to the um, historic period to now. Um, and looking at the Palo Indian just kind of researching on what distinguished um, this time era and what diagnostic materials was used to kind of understand what life was like for tribal people within this area. And from the photos in the back, it was just kind of photos that um, I researched on and hopefully from past scientists, um, this is kind of how life was like in this period. Um, then again, it was really difficult to find uh, photos. And here are just some diagnostic materials that were used and found within this, within these sites, within this period. And then going on to what life was like during the Palo Indian period. Um, once again, um, historians, archaeologists didn't really have a great understanding of like how um, people may have looked or may have hunted, but um, then again, like I know this feeds like the stereotype, the stereotypical image of Native Americans, um, and which is something that I feel like is very um, detrimental to the present day indigenous people today. Um, and just sharing the case of like how we kind of were like hunter and gatherers and then going into the archaic period, um, sharing more information about um, how this was like the period where um, seasonal attraction and the increasing of um, resources were also used um, by the indigenous people um, during this time period. And then going on to the different changes that um, this environment was going through during this time period and how that impacted um, the indigenous people during that time. And then these are the different sites within that location. And along with that, another um, forms of diagnostic material that they used and found from the middle archaic period um, shown here. And then also a motor here and a grinding stone was also found in this area just to show like they were um, grinding like corn, different foods, um, sources. And this just takes to show that um, indigenous people were here since time immemorial and they are still here. Um, and then in life during the Carrick period, another photo. Um, and then how they were learning about um, the uses of plants based on archeological um, information and the type of diagnostic materials that were found during this period and within that location. Um, and then looking at the woodland period, um, going into this, it's just showing like the different routes that, um, that were taken throughout the different tribal nations within um, this area and how like the trade system started to form 
um, within like tribal nations and also the use of technology has been advancing as well. And then finally, um, just listing the different diagnostic materials again and notes about what was found within this particular location, just showing that um, the presence of the indigenous people within this location and how important it is to also protect um, this from being extracted even more. And then again, life in the woodland period, um, this was like to current day and how as they started to form communities and started to settle in one place according to archaeological notes and how the black walnut was also one of the many tree species um, that indigenous people used. And today, um, just want to share that and share that um, not many people know that in this, in this area that um, indigenous people were um, we're here and <laughs> that they're still here um, living and thriving within this um, society. And I know a lot of people don't know the histories behind all of the different um, ways and the different um, time periods. And I just wanted to really understand um, what that was and to understand how that kind of looks like and what to do in terms of like sharing that information with others. I know it's a very important um, topic to discuss. And I think that's one of the ways that I've been trying to um, spread awareness to the histories of indigenous people to make sure that their language, their culture um, isn't erased because of archeological um, language usage or just the way they use different diagnostic materials. Um, so I just wanted to present about that and share um, what I've learned through that process and to share that there is a lot of things that need to get done within the field of study and to make it improved and to also um, involve more indigenous people within these different site visits within um, this history making because it is important and it will get passed down from generation to generation and to include the authentic stories of indigenous people, not just the ones that um, they see fit to involve in history. And so going off of that, um, that's, that's my just, and today I would like to introduce the next um, panelist. Her name is Crystal Ann Cav Cavalier. Um, is the co-founder of Seven Directions of Service with her husband. She is a citizen of the Okanachi Band of Saponi Nation in Burlington, North Carolina. She is the chair of the Environmental Justice Committee for the NAACP, a board member of the Ha River Assembly, and a member of the 2020 Fall Cohort of the Sahara's Club Gender Equity and Environment Program and Women's Earth Alliance accelerator for grassroots women environmental leaders. Crystal is currently working on her doctorate at the University of Dayton and dissertation on social justice of missing murdered indigenous women and gas oil pipelines in frontline communities. Crystal is also an expert in her field of strategic intelligence, political campaigns and public administration. She has conducted training along and around the East Coast on coordinated tribal community response for emergency management through natural, cyber, or man-made disasters. Thank you so much. Makuta Minchin Kiyohe, Nahal PP say, me my crystal, me my Okanichi Saponi, Watiwa. So I am going to present, Nazoni, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yep, you're good. Okay, sounds great. All right, let me put this in present mode. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to um, come here and talk about um, missing murder indigenous women. I am a citizen of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation here in Alamance County. Um, we do have ties to Virginia. So we lived east of the Monacans um, in Clarksville, Virginia on this little island called Okanichi Island, um, which is now flooded by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we used to call it Bugs Island, but I think it's called Car Lake or Car Dam. So that's where our island is. And then we migrated down here to North Carolina. So we do have ties to that. And then upcoming, um, 
the Monacan uh, nation are our um, sister tribe because we all are um, Suan uh, speaking people. So I wanted to talk about missing murder, indigenous women, girls, two spirits. Um, I kind of want to give an understanding. Um, I'm not quite sure if everyone knows, but I know here in the communities of North Carolina, you know, if you're on social media, you kind of know what the, those words stand for, MMIWG. Um, but most of what I found is the com community, people who don't interact with Native people, they don't understand what this epidemic is. And, you know, women and girls, they experience a lot of racism, experience a lot of violence, especially, um, and that is seen throughout the United States, Canada, and South America. Um, and we have to know how do we change that mentality. Um, you have to learn to de decolonize your history, right? So I do a lot of teaching um, about race and racism. We have to stand for people who are marginalized, beat, raped, murdered. Um, and we have to understand the importance of cultural awareness. We have to understand that our traditions here on the East Coast were taken from us before the formation of the United States. Um, and so we had to assimilate to a way of life. You know, our ancestors did that to protect us. Um, and we also experienced a lot of um, land degradation, violence, things like that. And so when people start to understand the history of uh, Virginia and North Carolina, um, they can start to understand how our people are now and how we're still thriving today. Um, like I was saying before, police and communities, they never been taught about the history of things like why this happened. Um, you know, the history that we learn um, in uh, high school or even grade school, it, it's not really the accurate history. Um, I won't go into that, but um, just know that there are some things left out of the text and it gives people a misconception. Like, you know, I try to explain this to my family. You know, we have these lively dinners um, and uh, Sometimes my family is like, why, why are you telling me about all of this? And I'm just like, because you have to understand people's mentality when it comes to um, indigenous people. Like I know in my community, um, Walter Pleckler, he did a, a damage. Um, he genocided a lot of our people by paper uh, and changed our race from indigenous or Indian to uh, black, um, mulatto or colored. And so, um, that just kind of erased us on paper. So you have to understand also colonialism, it forced and assimilated, like I was telling you before, it created a lot of problems. And a lot of these problems um, kind of wash out such as substance abuse, suicide, crime and poverty. You know, our people don't understand what has happened to them or they don't understand why they're having these feelings. And there's a lot of things to un un um, unpack. Uh, I just moved home five years ago. I used to work in Washington, D.C. for the federal government. And while I was there, you know, I wasn't as involved in my um, indigenous life. Like I just went to work, you know, I focused on work and then I came home. But then I kind of had this calling of, you know, I just needed to go home and be closer to my family. And when I got home and I got really close to my family um, back on our land, you know, I started to understand and experience these problems of racism, like underlying racism, but more, more now blatant racism. And these problems continue today. Um, and it's, you know, going on, you know, we have a lot of human trafficking that's happening across the state and a lot of people are understanding it. Um, like I was saying before, racist and sexist stereotypes um, deny the dignity and worth of indigenous women and girls encouraging men uh, to feel that they can get away with these violent acts. And we see that so much. Um, we also have a very huge rape culture that is present um, and is normalized. You see it in movies, you see it in um, books, you see it in everything. And they also do a lot of victim blaming, sexual objectification. Um, they also trivialize rape. And it, it just does a lot of harm to our people. Um, especially coming from a matriarchal society, most, not all, but most cultures here on the East Coast, indigenous cultures are, were matrilineal. Um, they're now kind of um, 
very male dominated now. Um, and then this has just been just decades, just building on, um, on top of each other. Um, it's, it's also very psychological, these attacks that we're doing. Um, and I mean, you can see it everywhere. You see it in society, you see it in prison, you see it everywhere. These type of attacks that are just um, attacking our people. Again, it's this rape culture. Um, and again, many police forces have failed to institute necessary measures such as training, accountability. Um, here in Robinson County, North Carolina, we have a lot of missing murder, indigenous women, uh, girls and uh, people period but the police don't respond um, in a timely manner. They often misclassify us as white, black, or Hispanic, and they don't classify the deaths as murders. They classify them as suspicious, right? They, they just don't label them appropriately. And so when you don't classify death properly, um, people don't investigate them. And so how severe is the problem? Like I was telling you guys before, institutional racism, um, it, it's all embedded, all of these social justice issues are all embedded um, one on top of the other. Um, what needs to happen to stop this violence? We gotta start with the education. We have to start with the concerted um, state response. So Virginia and North Carolina, and we have to start with awareness and education in these communities that American Indian tribes are still present and we still exist here today. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys, or you can read this, but um, we need to have these policies and practice implemented in response to these violence, um, violence that is experienced by indigenous women and girls. Um, and we need ways to honor and commemorate the missing and murdered indigenous women. So I don't know, yeah. So we have a rally and it's always the fourth, fourth Saturday of April every year and we, usually do it in person, but due to COVID, we've been doing it digitally for last year and this year. But if you go to this website, which is mmiwnc.com, you will see a live stream and we will call out names, especially in North Carolina. We, will, we have victims, we have victims, family members that come and talk about the experiences they've had with the police, with the media, um, and just not raising this awareness. Um, and I know I went through this really fast. I'll, I only had a, a small amount, but I wanted to make sure that I transition this over to the uh, no MVP. So MVP and no MVP Southgate, they're actually coming through West Virginia, Virginia in North Carolina. And these are extractive industries and studies have shown that man camps bring violence, localized violent crime in places where it would not otherwise be. These camps create a rapid increase in the population of the area which constrain the community infrastructure, such as law enforcement and human services. And especially in rural areas, you see these pipelines are coming through a lot of our rural communities. It's actually coming five minutes from where I live. Um, law enforcement, they are charged with providing services to extensive swaths of the land. And these man camps are temporary. The trauma and sexual violence and violent crime affects entire generations. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I tried to stick within the uh, 10 minutes. How did I do? Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Crystal. Um, our next panelist would be Desiree Shelley, is a climate justice organizer originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Desiree graduated from the University of Maryland um, College Park with a BS in environmental science and technology with a concentration in natural resource management and minor in Spanish um, language. After college, she worked in the fields of environmental education, natural resource management, and environmental restoration in Baltimore City. Through her work in the nonprofit sector and city government, she helped design and implement conservation education and service learning programs for the city schools, as well as trained and supported community volunteers with their restoration projects in local city parks. Welcome, Desiree Shelley. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen. <clears throat> okay. Present mode. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me. Um, 
as Crystal was mentioning, I am a member of Monacan Indian Nation, um, and we are like sister tribes. So Crystal and I have been working together for a while to protect um, our joint sacred sites um, because many of many of the, our territories overlap. And at one point in time, I'll talk a little about this more later, but um, we were once a larger confederacy that traded and intermarried and has a lot of cultural and historical ties. Um, so um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I will start um, by saying that when I was asked to give this presentation, I really struggled with how to narrow down such a vast and complex topic um, of settler violence on indigenous homelands. So this is not comprehensive, but rather look at one very specific experience that I feel less people are aware of. So that's my short disclaimer. Um, so this presentation will take a look at settler violence in the form of extractive industries, as uh, Crystal was just mentioning, and the protection of the sacred, our land, natural resources, ways of life, and ancestors. I will take a narrow focus on issues related to work that Crystal and I have done to protect our homelands from the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, and so just circling back, Crystal gave a wonderful presentation about missing and murdered Indigenous women. And that's really just one of the intersectional impacts that we see um, with extractive industries that come into um, Indigenous communities. Um, so I'm going to take a shift that now to look at how some of these industries, um, extractive industries, can also have intersectional impacts on other things that are sacred to us. Um, I first want to start with um, a discussion of, um, and taking a slight step back, um, to broadly define some terms and concepts that are at the crux of this conversation. We use terms often, um, but I sometimes notice that many people I discuss the topic with lack an understanding of the purpose of colonization, which um, I, very, I define as um, control, exploitation, and justification through devaluing Indigenous people in life ways. So these are just a couple definitions that I want to um, share. Um, one is that the colonization is the act of setting up a colony away from one's country of origin um, to gain control over the land and occupants for exploitation. However, as I was noting, colonization is also the process of devaluing and dehumanizing Native peoples um, through formal and informal methods in order to justify exploiting Indigenous people and their homelands. Now, um, Colonialism is very similar, but is defined as a control uh, by one power over a dependent area or people. It occurs when one nation subjugates another, conquering its population, and exploiting it, often while forcing its own language and cultural values upon its people. Um, generally, we think of colonization as past tense, um, something that happened, a group of people was colonized. Um, while it's true that it <clears throat> The first phase or act of colonization occurred in the past, colonialism as the practices that are ongoing and occurring today. So you kind of might see me use a mix of both terms, um, saying that you know, this is a colonialism act or this is colonization, and sometimes it overlaps. But um, it's important to think of how colonization did occur in the past, but that we are still experiencing colonialism um, today. Um, so I wanted to give, <laughs> Um, a brief history, um, and this again is not comprehensive, it's just a few important facts or things I'd like to point out that have really, um, it, meaning the purpose of this brief history was to set the stage and give an understanding of why US laws and policies have historically been in conflict with protecting indigenous sacred sites. Court decisions have historically devalued indigenous spiritual practices and land claims in favor of extractive industries, development, and capitalism. Policies have sought to remove indigenous people from lands whenever convenient to encourage exploitation and capitalistic pro uh, capitalist profits. Um, so <laughs> where I'm here, um, I live in Virginia. I didn't mention that in my bio, but I'm in Roanoke County. So um, taking it back to Jamestown, <laughs> Um, Jamestown did not, the settlement of Jamestown didn't cause all of these issues, but that's really where um, ground zero happened in Virginia. And it was the beginning of some of the forced relocation or necessary migration of indigenous people um, due to settler encroachment, um, the bringing about of disease, increased conflict between tribes also um, due to lack of natural resources or lack of lands. And um, as met, not as many people know this piece, but the kidnapping also um, began around this time of indigenous people into the slave trade um, to Europe and into the Caribbean. 
Um, and often, I, I'm not really talking, this is another important topic, but I'm not only kind of touching on here, but um, some indigenous communities also en enslaved some of their own um, too. So then there was also that conflict causing this forced relocation. Um, and then why am I talking about relocation and the sacred sites? Well, because our sacred sites are so focused on place and are place-based. So when indigenous people are removed from these sites, then we lose access to those. And that's a topic you'll hear me talk about more. Um, 1714, Fort Christiana is built, um, and the many Tutelosa Pony people who, like, um, to give you, we use a lot of different terms historically, but those are also the Monacan Okanichi and other Eastern Suan tribes. Um, so those nations, as well as Tuscarora, um, were um, sought refuge um, because of these colonial pressures or relocated um, to Fort Christiana um, after their homelands were taken. Most of the people who relocated here were Christianized and assimilated into European culture. Then in the 1870s and 80s, many indigenous religious practices were prohibited by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and those who were employed by them. Many had to hide their practices under Christian holidays. Um, and East Coast natives at this time were also not recognized by the US. So as Crystal was mentioning earlier, I'll talk a little bit more about Walter Plecker too, and the influence of eugenics and how that um, also created this rift between us and our cultural practices and sacred sites. Um, so in 1924, the Racial Integrity Act in Virginia, this was part of um, Jim Crow laws, some of the most extreme. Um, it prohibited interracial marriage and required all birth certificates be labeled as either white or colored. Um, it erased any classification of Indian or Native American. Um, and it was like, as I said, part of the eugenics movement that was, um, this was spearheaded by Walter Plecker. Um, so it really was there to erase our identity and land claims um, by grouping us in with other either colored or white um, individuals. And then, so then post-World War II, um, expansion and development. Um, after this time period, um, there were a lot of areas prior to World War II that were still left unsettled or undeveloped. And um, at those times, some, a lot of many Native people could continue to visit their sacred sites and places um, kind of under the radar. But after World War II, you saw this huge expansion of development, um, industrial agriculture. Um, and so these formerly marginal lands that no one wanted, suddenly they began to find um, reasons to exploit them. Um, so Native people were no longer allowed to access those sites. Um, 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act is a resolution that was passed by Congress um, to protect and preserve American Indian rights um, to practice traditional religions. Agencies were asked to evaluate policies and practices to better protect these rights. Um, now, <laughs> we'll see that this was not always put into place, this practice, but that resolution was there. Um, and then specifically in 1988, the Supreme Court decision of Ling versus the Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association found that the free exercise of religion did not prevent government agencies from using its property in ways it deemed appropriate, regardless of religious use. Um, in this case, um, this case was looking at logging of an indigenous site. So although this act was passed by Congress, um, the court didn't necessarily uphold it when it came to cases that were presented to it. And that was really damaging. And this was, of course, a Supreme Court decision. So it applied to all indigenous groups throughout the country. Um, so um, it goes without saying that Native Americans have had a difficult time protecting their lands over the history of the United States. Once the reservation system was created and the legal status of Native Americans was firmly entrenched in place um, within the US legal system, sacred sites remain discrete issue for, for those by, of Indian descent. Um, but again, court cases and decisions after this, like this um, Ling versus Northwest Indian Cemetery, um, really helped turn the tide so that it was make, becoming more and more difficult to protect these sites. Um, next, um, I wanted to uh, talk, I, I don't like to talk too much, but uh, and I know we don't have a ton of time, but I'd love to have a few people share in the chat, how do you define sacred? Because I use that word a lot and it's one of those terms that I don't know um, that I'm gonna get into and talk a bit, little bit about, about how maybe Western civilization um, defines it differently than um, indigenous worldviews. Um, so you can, I guess we, yeah, we can put it into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, and then if I see a few, I can also share 
um, people's perspectives of how, what does it mean to be something that is sacred? And while you're sharing that, um, I am going to um, talk a little bit about the term sacred and the um, how it is defined uh, differently between um, different uh, um, definitions. So sacred describes something that is um, dedicated or um, set apart for the worship or of a deity considered um, worthy of spiritual respect or devotion or inspires awe or reverence among believers. The word sacred descends from the Latin um, sacer, referring to that which is con consecrated, dedicated, or purified to the gods or anything um, in their power. So as you can see, often in Western thought, the term sacred is um, often applied to objects, acts, deeds, or practices, where in Western, um, and less so in natural, to refer to natural um, places. Um, I'll share another definition uh, from the Native Organizers Alliance that sacred place um, and their sacred place campaign, which is something Crystal is working on. Um, and sorry, that was my timer. So I think I'm running out of time. So I'll go through some of the next slides pretty fast. Um, but um, sacred place um, is the, um, is, is um, Native nations and indigenous people have been here since time immemorial. We stand together to protect our sacred places, medicines, burials, ancestors, and cultural items and ceremonial ways, and to ensure indigenous voices and representation lead um, in these important matters pertaining to our rights, freedoms, and ways of life. These um, represent a sacred duty and traditional laws which are indigenous to these lands. Um, now, I'm wanting to share that um, Indigenous uh, views of sacred sites can sometimes differ from this. Um, indigenous, uh, or, or can be different. There are often natural places um, that are more than objects or actions. A sacred place is somewhere that connects us to our past, to the teachings of our ancestors, and reminds us of how we should live and that all things are connected. I, I mentioned this distinction to highlight why there are challenges protecting indigenous sacred sites within Western legal and court systems or government frameworks and that the philosophy between the defini two definitions do not always sync. Um, and that this concept is often not understood by Western cultures and religions. The idea that ceremonies are place-based within a communal traditional, um, within a communal tradition at specific sites rather than based on doctrine makes the two interpretations not comparable. Although sacred sites do exist in Western um, religions, they are generally not found in North America. And because native people have been on this continent for time immemorial, we have numerous sacred sites throughout our traditional homelands that signify our history. Um, and this and is a picture of Rasawick. It is considered the ancient and principal city or town within the um, Monacan Confederacy. Um, and it, this site holds much of our history and um, as well as a sacred waterway, the Riviana. So I wanted to just share that as an example of a sacred site that is here in Virginia. Um, so moving on to what is sacred, well, often we hear the terms of water is life and uh, mini, mini wakoni or mini wachoni when we, along with the terms, defend the sacred. Um, so I'm not suggesting that water is more sacred than our other natural elements. As indigenous people, we recognize the equal importance of each element and how all things are interconnected. Um, for example, a traditional fire keeper is a role of great importance during ceremonies. A traditional Thanksgiving address or honoring ceremony could go on for the better part of a day as we honor and give thanks to each and every living and non-living thing that continues contributes to our shared existence. Um, however, I'm choosing to highlight water in this presentation because it's often threatened and under attack by extractive industries. Um, and I also consider myself a water protector. So I'm going to go to move on to talk about why um, I'm focusing on water and its um, influence with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, and please let me know where I am on time too, because I, um, I, I, tried, I feel like I turned off my timer. So if I need to move You're about out of time, yeah. Okay, um, so I would just quickly show a few of our last slides here. Um, uh, this is one of some of the impacts on MVP. Um, but on our waterways, you can see the amount of sedimentation um, and the impacts on endangered species. This is the Roanoke log perch. Um, and then this is the route of the MVP, as Crystal had mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and then again, this is some of the areas um, that Ms. Joni helped to 
highlight in her um, presentation about um, the mapping and the indigenous people that are along those routes. Um, and again, this shows some of those tribes as well. Um, so to wrap up, I'd like to just, and I'll, I'll only take another minute or so, but uh, share a couple of these sacred sites um, that are along the MVP route that have been threatened. And this one in particular is a example of a burial mound. Um, and burial mounds were secondary burial sites for both Monacan, Okanichi, and other Eastern Suan groups, um, where often our ancestors, they were buried um, where they fell. And then later during ceremonial times, they would um, remove their remains or their bones and then bury them again with their ancestors um, in a place where they would come back and often do ceremonies. Um, so this is a, actually one of the burial sites in Roanoke County, similar to the sites that um, Nijoni was um, mapping. Um, and then here's a closer look, not the same burial mound, but a depiction of a burial mound um, by Thomas Jefferson that was excavated um, through slave labor. And you can kind of see what the burial mound would have looked like. Um, and then again, um, indigenous people often have lack access to these. So although traditionally uh, Monacan people and others would return to these sites for ceremony, um, most of the sites now are on private property. So um, we, we lack access to be able to go back to do ceremonies on a yearly basis where our ancestors lay. Um, and then, so this is an example of some of the artifacts and things that are found along these sites. Um, unfortunately, also many of the tribes um, in Virginia and North Carolina are not federally recognized. So they do not have the ability to um, formally consult with FERC about these processes. Um, you know, they can receive information about what is found, but don't have any access to them. So that's another challenge facing um, people. And often the surveyors who FERC will send in or the pipeline company will send in have no experience or knowledge about East Coast Indigenous peoples. So they often incorrectly identify um, burial mounds as maybe agricultural rock piles, or um, they look at, um, some of these artifacts and they don't understand the full significance. Um, so again, I just wanna uh, quickly acknowledge too that these sites are not just in Virginia, um, that they are both in um, North Carolina as well. Um, the MVP Southgate extension um, will also be going through um, historical areas of Lower Sartown and Upper Sartown, um, the Dan River and others. And I'm, oh, I don't wanna take up too much more time. So I hope we can ask, answer more questions about that, especially Crystal and our questions. Um, and then lastly, this is my last slide, but Crystal um, is working, I wanted to give a shout out to the things she's working on. Um, this red road to DC, um, really looking at the fact that we have a new administration and potentially um, administration that will hear our, um, you know, pleas for protecting indigenous sacred sites. Um, so this is a, a totem pole journey and we can provide more information. I'll share um, links to this um, in the, um, in the chat after I'm done speaking. And then also the MVP Southgate Water Walk, which will be bringing um, awareness around the waters um, impacted by the MVP Southgate as well as the mainland. And we'll be walking some of the route in the Southgate from the Southern part of Virginia to North Carolina. And um, thank you so much. These are some of the references and things I always encourage people to, to read more about. And I can share um, some of these works about um, our history here in Virginia. So Bilauk in our language means thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and our next panelist would be Amanda Lee Savage is an instructor and academic advisor in the Department of History at the University of Memphis and has lived and worked in Memphis, Tennessee since 2010. During that time, she's delivered numerous talks around the state addressing indigenous issues in American culture and the work required to decolonize civic and academic spaces. Her current project, Decolonizing Memphis, aims to create a decolonized history of the city, one that centers indigenous and immigrant narratives, embraces indigenous epistemologies and generates new types of native authors, sources of academics and activists to incorporate in their work. In addition to teaching and mentoring duties, Ms. Savage is the co-creator of the Tiger Food Pantry and a member of Pride and Equity Alliance, the first LGBTQIA plus faculty and staff association at the University of Memphis. She is the co-founder of Native Rights, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advocating for indigenous peoples in the Mid-South. 
Welcome, Amanda Lee Savage. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. And Joni, let me just say, I had a chance to see your project ahead of this presentation and I was blown away by just how sophisticated it was, but how you rendered such complicated things really understandable for people. So I grew up actually in the Roanoke Valley and um, my family are hardcore Hokies. I have a lot of ties to Virginia Tech. Um, and I can say that I, I never learned about the indigenous people of the region I grew up in. Um, and so I, the work you're doing is so necessary. So thank you so much for that. Um, I am happy to be here with everyone today. I am speaking to you from the historic homeland of the Chickasaw Nation, which is now present day Memphis, Tennessee. Um, <clears throat> and I just have actually, to be honest, never been on a panel um, with other indigenous people before. I am, I am not an, an indigenous North American. I am a um, native Hawaiian. And so my family is Kanaka Maoli and my um, family is also settler. They're also white. And so this is just a real um, treat for me. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the work that we're doing here in Memphis, Tennessee to decolonize um, and how we decided to go about doing that. And then maybe um, just for people who were interested in incorporating some of these practices into the work that they're doing, I've put together a couple of slides about decolonization and um, indigenization and, and how those things are different and why we ought to be doing both. So despite using Zoom for a year, I might still be a little clunky. Right, so I did want to open though by talking a little bit about Native rights. Um, it's an exciting group to be a part of. Um, Zianya Hawk Cruz is the co-founder and she was my student at the University of Memphis. And it's one of those moments where if you have ever been the only one of something in a public space and then you find somebody like you, um, it becomes very exciting. And so we were incredibly excited to find one another um, and then to work together after she graduated. Um, after doing a few talks around Memphis, you know, November is an incredibly busy time if you live in a place where there's a very small indigenous population and everybody, you know, wants to learn a little bit about natives for Native American Heritage Month. Um, we decided that we should get together and maybe, you know, do this a bit more strategically. And so we came up with an organization called Native Rights, and that's Natives Reclaiming Our Indigenous Truths, um, Education, and Sovereignty. And we do have a majority indigenous board, um, because in order to be a nonprofit, you have to have a board and there's a little, a lot to be said about trying to practice decolonization while you have to join an organization and create an organization that um, you know, is part of colonization, but that's probably for another panel. Um, and all of our members though have roots in North and South America and the Pacific Islands. And we are all educators, activists, and artists in some capacity. I um, mean, one of our goals beyond sort of advocating for indigenous issues in the Mid-South and, and hoping to better, you know, politicize and indigenize the space um, is to celebrate one another to help people reconnect to those roots that they might have been fractured from through the processes of colonization, um, to encourage the decolonization of education, especially at the K-12 level here, um, and you know to participate in the liberation of black and brown people. And so we find that our um, efforts are very closely aligned with our local BLM chapter here. We live in a city with rampant anti-blackness, um, even though it is a majority black city. And so our, um, we are often working in tandem with a number of other organizations in the Mid-South. Um, but I have to say that I don't think that I could do this work without them. We keep each other in check. Um, I am sure to say that colonialism is, you know, turbulent is an understatement. Um, but because we are often all educated in Western schools um, and maybe especially in the work we do, you know, I work at a university and I, I do think of myself as being a historian. I try my best, um, but I have been educated as well in, in colonial systems and in colonial ways of thinking and doing, even if I am indigenous. And that tide can really carry you if you're not careful. And so I think that being with an indigenous community, really grounding and rooting yourself in, in that work is important so that you don't get carried away with it. And so as I mentioned, we are, we are trying to invite invisibility and erasure in the Mid-South and, and both Najoni and um, Crystal spoke about this, the violence of erasure and why that is allowing more violence to be perpetuated against indigenous people. And like I said, we do a lot of inreach to our indigenous community. And then of course our educational outreach to non-indigenous communities. Um, and this is what is I think considered the Mid-South. It was not a term I had heard until I moved here and there were not a lot of good maps of that, but we're sort of looking at like Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. We don't go so far as Texas. And so these are the two quotes that I often um, use to guide myself in this work of decolonization. Um, and the first one is probably really familiar, right? For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. 
I mean, when we think about decolonization, right, we know that this means that we have to dismantle colonialism um, quite a bit. And, and I'll talk about that in a moment in the next slide. Um, but that can be hard and, and not just hard, but sometimes there are tools that we need to use or that we need to employ in order to do this work. And so I also think about what Susan Miller says. Um, and she says that decolonizing projects include both the recovery of lapsed indigenous practices and the utilization of non-indigenous practices for indigenous purposes. Um, and so to illustrate that, um, we actually had a really wonderful exhibit come through here last year called Native Voices. I mean, it's an, an exhibit full of indigenous artists and indigenous art, um, and not sort of in just the, um, you know, if you're not making art that people consider indigenous or Americana, that's the only way you're going to get into this exhibit. It was very modern. Um, and so these were some baskets that are woven by um, a member of the Eastern Band of Chickasaw Indians. And she takes treaties and maps and, and things that really have colonial meanings. Um, and then she breaks them apart and weaves them in, in traditional Cherokee fashion. And I've always loved this idea about decolonization where you can dismantle something and destroy it. But, but if the tools are there, you can also use it to build the new thing and an indigenous thing. And so when, I, when I'm doing this work and I find that like I just can't make my project happen, I think about how I need to just dismantle all of it. And when I am drawing on things I have learned through my colonization and my colonial education, um, I think about the ways I ought to indigenize it. And so we have to recognize colonial ideologies before they can be destructed and destroyed. And um, this is where I thought Desiree did such a good job by defining those terms for us, because these are words that we toss around often, um, and, and maybe we aren't using them correctly, maybe we're not even sure what they mean. And I know that it can be incredibly hard. I mean, we call it the status quo for a reason. Um, and if we're not aware of the way our status quo is, you know, in and of itself, a colonial framework, we might not know that we need to destroy it or dismantle it or challenge it. Colonialism would have you believe that the status quo is the only way things could have been and the only way that things could have ended up. And, and decolonization teaches us to look around that, right? We, we see maybe the ways things could have gone or the ways that things were before colonialism came and, and changed those structures. And so I, I do think that there are a couple of ways that we can practice decolonizing our work. And I think the first thing we have to do always is center our community, right? We have an accountability to others when we do this kind of work. And that is not something that academics always think about. Um, often academics are doing work for just the sake of having the argument or the sake of exploring something. Um, but when you're doing decolonizing work, and especially when you're indigenizing that work, that's not the case. We have an accountability to one another. And that doesn't mean that we don't still do rigorous work. It just means that we think more broadly, I think about the implications of that work. Um, centering your community helps you adjust when you get off course. And that is just to kind of go back to this idea that colonization runs deep and it runs deep in many of us, even if we are indigenous, because we participate in these structures, we have to, or at least right now we have to, hopefully in the future, we won't have to. Um, and so I find that, that having a community does help you course correct when you need to. Um, and then the other thing to think about when you're doing this work is, is it actually accessible for all? And I know that often in the college setting, we imagine that the work we're doing is accessible, but often it's not. And whether that's because we are not writing in a way that's accessible or because we have taken ideas or interviews or, or sources and, and then maybe digitize them and people don't have access to the internet, they might not have any way to, to get into the information that you were hoping to share. And so I think as long as we're thinking about accessibility for the people who we say we are doing this work on behalf of, um, we, have to, we have to really incorporate that. And then this is a way that you can also use old tools for a new use. And so who I would think is the most important question we can ask in any of this. And not just whose voices are we centering um, and hopefully we are centering you know, indigenous voices if we're doing indigenous work. But whose research are we drawing on? Who are we citing as our experts? Who are we putting into the historiographies that we're creating when we do this kind of work? Um, and then who gets to tell us you know, whether or not that's acceptable or not? Sometimes we are working within paradigms that we cannot really push back against and still have jobs. And so even if that's the case, being aware of it and taking it into consideration is incredibly important. Um, and then, of course, we want to think often about what we're talking about um, and when and where. Um, Desiree, I think, did a really good job talking about place-based um, Indigenous ideas and, and this idea of the sacred. Where and doing place-based histories is really critical to this. Um, but who determined those boundaries? 
And if you're sort of basing your win within a particular time frame, who said that had to be the case? Uh, my favorite example to use of this is I'm talking about voting rights in what is now present day Tennessee. Um, you know, we did all of this work to celebrate the 100 years of women, you know, not having the right to vote, but not being prohibited from voting on the basis of gender. Um, but, but in this region, when the Chickasaw were here, when the Choctaw were here, those were matrilineal societies where women had a lot of access to political engagement. And so this idea that women have had the right to vote for a hundred years, if we, if we take away the colonial structure, right, that says the time that the United States is here is the only time that matters. Um, we then see that, that women in this region have always been political and those 100 years of colonization were like a dark time in, in this region's history when women didn't have the right to, to participate. And that changes our, our views, our scope, our landscape. And I think that these things matter. And so we wanna think about indigenizing our work. Um, you know, we wanna center indigenous voices. We wanna honor indigenous protocols. And I, um, if you're unfamiliar with the indigenous protocols of the organizations or of the peoples you're working with, I would recommend contacting them. You know, not all knowledge is for all people and is to be adopted and appropriated and then exploited by academics. Um, doing things again for the sake of research is not, not how we roll if we're doing this work. And then you want to situate it situated in, within indigenous epistemologies, cosmos, and history. Um, and I don't have a better map on the on the right, sadly, but um, I need to learn how to make my own maps. But I thought these maps illustrated something um, that was really useful if you are useful if you just needed a snapshot of what I mean. So the map on the left, right? You can see the present day United States outlined on it, and you can see the present day states outlined on it, but it also includes territory that belongs to indigenous nations. And until I went looking for a map like this, I had not seen a map of the United States where it was very clear where those nations were and where that land was. Um, and so there is no reason that if we are practicing decolonizing education um, that we shouldn't all be using maps of the present day United States that clearly depict what land is not belonging to the United States. So I would consider this like a decolonizing step. Um, the map on the right is, is one that is, a, it's that map out of Canada where you can like zoom in and see all of the land that um, belongs to indigenous people and all of the groups who have moved through the land. And I love it, it's a wonderful website. Um, but this map, you know, you can make out the shape of what is now the United States, but it's all indigenous. And so I think one map sort of emphasizes what it might be to do decolonizing work. The other one is when we indigenize work and those things, while they are related, are, are very different. And so why do we do this work? Um, you know, we do this work for reasons that everybody has actually already outlined. And so I'm probably just going to be a little bit repetitive um, at this point, you know. Uh, disappearance, dehumanization, and disconnection from our communities and our land are why we do this. And disappearing Indigenous people has real ramifications. Um, and the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls epidemic is, is one, and it's probably the most visible one. And it's the most heinous example of this. Um, indigenous women are not just disappeared from their families, of course, and from their communities, but also from the data, from the media, from our narrative, and from awareness. And when we minimize and trivialize and erase Indigenous people from the US narrative, uh, people in the US are able to continue to dehumanize us. And mythologizing people is also dehumanizing. I know that people will also often say, well, I just love indigenous culture. You know, our mascot is not disrespectful. No, anything that you do that is like that is still, is still dehumanizing. And so dehumanization contributes not only towards the violence committed against indigenous people, but it also allows the perpetuators to continue to get away with it. And, and that is a huge problem as we are continuing to see in the news um, in our violence against our um, black citizens here. The way we write US history now and the way that we teach it in schools allows those who commit these acts of violence, the US government in particular, to take refuge in the passive voice, right? Things just happened. You know, the United States just had to move west. Indian removal was enacted. Um, or to hide behind the idea of progress as being for the collective good. And um, Mauna Kea, I think, is another really good example of a sacred site in Hawaii. Um, where they wanted to put up that 30 meter telescope and they were hoping to put up that telescope, you know, for the greater good, for science. It was going to benefit everybody um, without considering what damage that would do to the indigenous people there. Um, and when you say that, you know, your pain and your destruction and this violence against you is for the greater good of everyone else, well, then what does that say? Like, you don't belong to the collective. You're expendable so that other people can advance. Um, and that continues, you know, to dehumanize people. 
in ways that that you know are really unacceptable. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing this because I thought that I was timing myself and I did not actually start the timer. Um, but I do want to add that I think that decolonization and, and indigenizing is for the benefit of everyone, not just for indigenous people. You know, it, it teaches us that things don't have to be the way they are, that racism doesn't have to continue to exist, that sexism and, and the gender binary and prejudice against people does not have to continue to exist. And when we take those steps and use those tools to challenge our status quo, you know, we can begin to unravel and dismantle those things. Um, and then when we indigenize that, when we bring back sort of these indigenous perspectives and epistemologies, we no longer continue to isolate and exclude people who not only deserve to be part of the conversation, but frankly have the most right to be setting the tone in those conversations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And now our next panelist will go to Melissa Flair, um, Faircloth serves as the, as the director of the American Indian and Indigenous Community Center at Virginia Tech and also advises the Indigenous Student Organization Native at VT. Originally from North Carolina, she is an enrolled member of the Kahiri tribe and earned her bachelor's and master's at East Carolina University. She is currently completing her doctoral dissertation, which focuses on Native student experience in higher education. As a previous diversity scholar, she initiated and planned the first intertribal powwow at Virginia Tech. She also taught within the disciplines of American Indian Studies and Sociology. Welcome, Melissa Fitla. Thank you, Najerni, for that um, gracious introduction. Um, today, I'm going to briefly speak about the preliminary findings and themes from my dissertation research. Um, but more will evolve out of that um, as I'm still analyzing data, but what I really want to take the time to do here is prop up and contextualize that research through a contemporary and historical lens. Um, the project focuses on the intersection of indigeneity and higher education. It examines the varied backgrounds from which Native students hail, their experiences initially navigating larger institutions, their experiences on campus throughout their trajectory and their experience with campus resources, most notably Indigenous cultural centers. Um, it utilizes a qualitative approach to center the Native student voice and their experiences while understanding um, their experiences while understanding the impact of institutional resources. Um, but again, before we get into some of those findings, I want to look at the contentious history between indigenous communities and institutions of higher learning. When I think about that historical trajectory and what this relationship has looked like, it often reminds me of the most toxic types of romantic entanglements. You know the kind. When you're not interested, the individual won't leave you the hell alone. And when you are, they're emotionally unavailable or um, inaccessible. I think my students would, in contemporary times, refer to this as ghosting. Indeed, the indigenous experience in higher ed is most often described as one of either assimilation or complete and utter ghosting. The implementation of boarding schools in the 19th to mid 20th century saw education wielded against native peoples to aggressively strip them from their cultures and languages. Additionally, the 19th century saw the rise of rationalist thought which rejected religious and dogmatic views of inherent superiority to make way for scientific ways that we could construct the other, thereby deploying research and education to maintain the status quo. Anthropology as a field has long been critiqued for this construction of black and brown bodies as both exotic and inferior. Maggie Vane and Ferris state that science replaced the church but maintained that some souls and bodies were still superior to others. Even further, indigenous knowledge has been continually extracted in areas like ecology and pharmaceutical research to gain um, for the gain of privatized corporations, giving us neither intellectual credit nor financial stability to the native communities they pillage. The Moral Act of 1862, which only recently garnered national discussion, stripped indigenous peoples west of the Mississippi of their lands and territories. Those lands were sold to fund land grant institutions like Virginia Tech in the East, causing an additional displacement of Eastern woodland tribes. Um, and institutions still benefit from those endowments established through those funds. Even further, Gabrielle Tayak wrote about the 1920s and 1930 policies that allowed for many states across the US 
to deploy now debunked, but then widely accepted pseudoscience to extensive eugenics practice, practices. Here in Virginia, native women, black women, and even poor white women were forced sterilized through as late as the 1960s and 1970s. According to the National Institute of Health, um, eugenics ideology and pseudoscience was accompanied um, by support from the state, which allowed for the forced sterilization of 3,406 American Indian women without their permission between 1973 and 1976. Accompanied by the physical erasure was the paper erasure that other scholars on this panel have mentioned. Under Walter Plecker, the once head of idle statistics in Virginia, citizens could only choose two categories on birth certificates, either white or colored. You were either white or you weren't white. And colored was an ambiguous catch-all category that was most often interpreted as black, erasing any documentation of native identity. This has placed the burden of proof on tribal communities in the East to prove their indigeneity with little to no paper documentation. In 1954, the passing of Brown versus Board called for the desegregation of American Indian schools, or of American schools, excuse me. However, we know that not all schools, particularly those in the South, immediately adhere to this ruling. I remember taking a trip with colleagues, some who I recognize on this call today, to Monacan Indian Nation's Tribal Administrative Office. Adjacent to that office was a one-room schoolhouse where Chief Dean Branham talked about his ancestors um, attending that school. Even after schools were supposed to have integrated, Branham recounted for us that many times bus drivers would simply pass by Native children without stopping. Virginia Indians did not gain access to public schools until around 1962. So here we've come full circle for, from forced assimilation through education and boarding schools to denial and lack of access. Think of how juxtaposed those two strategies are at different points in time and who that benefits and who it does not. I'm not, not sure how much those monsters have disappeared or how they have just merely shape-shifted. As I reflect on meetings with students and interviews, it's not uncommon that their worldviews are disregarded in the classroom. It's not uncommon that faculty construct the other and ask Native students to speak on their behalf or to speak on the behalf of 574 federally recognized tribes. I've been expected to do the same in some educational settings as an AP faculty member. The legacy of denying education across uh, or the denying education access to Native students means that many are first generation. I recognize that first generation experience is not uncommon among other minority groups or even poor white communities. But I'm tracing here for a particular group what factors have led to severe and justified distrust and a lack of social capital among students described in these interviews. Having parents that attended college is a very specific form of social capital that better equips some majority and affluent students compared to first generation students that are native students often occupy that space. This prevalence can be traced to these historical mechanisms and we have a duty to remedy that. Insufficient racist and romanticized K through 12 educational curriculum regarding native peoples also impacts the way in which they experience their peer groups on college, yeah, at college. Their peers um, know little more than narratives which celebrate and justify colonial endeavors or rely heavily on stereotypes from film and media. Students report having their identities either invalidated or not knowing how to awkwardly respond well to well-meant stereotypes about being closer to nature. Many of my findings bolster the limited literature which currently exists on student experience. Um, though they're relatively absent from higher ed literature, argu arguably another form of invisibility. Um, however, the interesting thing my research illuminates is twofold. One, the extensive reach which invisibility and erasure has, which goes as far to per as to permeate spaces intentionally carved out for Native students. I'm speaking about the fact that many students still report microaggressions happening within a Native cultural center. Comparative analysis may be warranted to determine whether this is the case for other identity centers as well. Um, but I hypothesize that this is happening um, due, first of all, to geographic and historical contexts. Um, this may not be the case at every institution. We have to take in consideration um, where we're located geographically, the history um, of the state and, and factors um, around Virginia history. However, there is this more broad narrative um, in our American imagination and the history that is America 
um, that makes erasure and invisibility very commonplace. And Native people experience a form of legitimized racism that permeates the very spaces intent to providing them reprieve. It is a case study which we should acknowledge um, may again have commonplace issues and that are widespread across the country, but also acknowledges the unique climate um, of varying institutions. I don't suggest that um, every Indigenous center might experience these types of things, but we have to consider the unique positionality that Native students occupy when we're thinking about how we construct these centers and how we construct campus resources that support Native students. What I was pleasantly surprised to find, however, is that these experiences do not outweigh the fond ways in which students talk about these spaces or resources. Almost all of them directly or at least in part attribute having such a space as imperative to their persistence and ability to graduate. So I'll share briefly two contrasting examples which best um, exemplify my qualitative findings. One student recounts an experience of a non-native student coming up to them in the center um, and asking if they were indigenous. Uh, when they replied yes, the response was, well, you don't look indigenous. And also because of land bridge theory, you're actually Mongolian. They're not really natives. So if you're in your own space and you have to still in that space um, confront other people telling you who you are and who you are not, um, students often describe a type of racial fatigue um, that they are seeking out these spaces to get away from. But simultaneously, um, students also talk about the ability to find community by the virtue of having a space. They're across all different kinds of majors, and so they would not likely be able to find each other if it weren't for those um, types of spaces. Looking through a historical lens, um, we have a great deal to understand as campus administrators in regards to the degree of mistrust and the issues um, that have to be overcome when it regards our Native students. Most people are not aware of these histories, um, but in communities based on oral history, these stories are passed down and are not in a very distant memory. Simultaneously, erasure and invisibility, romanticization and microaggressions impact the everyday experiences of Native students. Um, and some of this is due to historical issues, but some is also due to a failure of contemporary institutions and a failure of contemporary policy. All of this nuanced information has to be taken in consideration when we look at these types of spaces and construct resources for our Native student population. Additionally, it is unacceptable, unacceptable to deploy corporatized explanations regarding low numbers and cost benefit analysis as institutions continue to profit from indigenous displacement and knowledge while not caring for whether indigenous peoples are thriving within these spaces. I yield. Hello. I'm back again. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Missy, and all our speakers uh, for your fantastic uh, information that you shared with us. And we're now going to move into the Q&A section where I will be helping out here and uh, fielding questions for all of our speakers. So we do have quite a bit of questions here. If you do have any more questions that you haven't already asked, feel free to pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. So. Let's go to uh, one of the first ones here that I uh, that I saw that I thought was pretty interesting, and that was uh, going back to what Desiree mentioned during her talk, which was about the sacredness. So a couple people talked about, uh, one person said that they think sacred is honored, and I saw someone else say something along the lines of, is anything really sacred anymore? So, um, and I think that's maybe a good point of, of discussion. So I'd like to hear what you have to say to, to these things, uh, Desiree. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did try to answer some things in the chat box since I knew we were over time. Um, and I think the discussion of what is sacred is really important. And I, I didn't even share everything I had um, hoped to, to share as well. But the idea of um, something being a, a place that is sacred versus things that are objects or acts, I think, is a huge um, difference that we sometimes see between Western and Indigenous cultures and that um, 
are things anything sacred anymore? That's a really hard question. And it also feels a little pessimistic um, because sometimes it feels like within our um, confines or our construct of like our US government system and the way capitalism works that nothing is sacred, um, that we don't value land. We don't, um, we don't see nature as having rights. Um, but I am seeing these new movements of things such as like the rights of nature, um, identifying like rivers, for example, as um, giving them a person status. And those things are happening even in the New River Valley. I think um, one of the local rivers is actually, um, th there's some um, a, a potential um, local ordinance that could give um, rights to those these to certain water bodies, which I think is huge. And that's a huge shift away from our current thinking of what is sacred and what is not. Um, so that's just kind of some thoughts I've had about that of what, um, of how we can adjust our Western mind frame of what is sacred um, into a, a kind of a legal status, which is kind of not indigenous. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I'd love to hear what other people have to say too. Would anybody like to? Take a swing at that. Desiree, I think you did a pretty good job of uh, just talking about sacred. Um, like Desiree said, um, I'm working on this project with the Native Organizers Alliance, uh, um, talking about sacred places. And uh, we're taking a totem pole journey um, from the Lumi tribe. And we're going to drive to these sacred places out west and then ultimately give it to President Biden to remind him of his promise to Indian country of the protection of sacred spaces. So it, it just really depends um, on each tribe's um, definition of what is sacred. Absolutely. Um, anybody else wanna take a stab at this one or should we move on to the next question here? All right, so I have a question here that I think many of you hopefully can can chime in on, and that's regarding um, origin stories or or migration stories, and and when certain groups become groups where they are, right? And and the distinction between what uh, nations, tribes, and communities believe, and what we might be taught in classes, and how that kind of can sometimes link to this idea and kind of what uh, Melissa talked about. Um, that native peoples were the first immigrants to this continent, right? So I'd like to hear what uh, all of you might have to say about that and, and what the best practices might be for some of you are, are educators, or all of you are in different ways, I guess, right? And uh, I'd like to hear what those best practices are and how do we reconcile what we learn about land bridges and all those kinds of things and then what people actually believe and, and what you know is, is the perspective from native communities. So for me, um, I tend to, you know, I'm not, I'll admit I'm not as well versed as to what that research says. Um, however, I think what it denies is um, a very long standing connection to place. Um, so even if that, you know, information is justified, um, disregarding indigenous identity when we know for a fact that there's a long long-standing connection to place in the North Americas um, is unacceptable. Um, there there have always been groups across the globe that have migrated in different in different points of time but that relationship to geography um, and then what that colonial relationship evolved to um, during contact, um, I think that's kind of at the crux of it, of, of that breakdown that occurred during contact. Um, and so I always try to be mindful of, of that and try to educate people um, in that regard. Um, to the previous question uh, of what is sacred, I think right now I'm thinking in my position in particular in education, um, of mental health a lot for students. And I'm really looking forward to the days that we can get together, hopefully more next semester. Um, and I'm thinking back to a particular time that we all took a trip um, that Monica Nation graciously did a sweat for our students. Um, and regardless of how that was looked at by the institution and concerns around um, liability, um, you could tell there was a deep lack of understanding of what that practice is. 
Um, and I tend to uh, ask forgiveness instead of permission <laughs> because that was a um, just revitalizing thing for our students. And it was a way that they cared for themselves and their mental health. Um, and so I'm trying to think about ways we can bring traditional practices back into addressing student mental health and student. Fantastic. Anybody else want to chime in on either point? Go back to sacred or, or this question about. Uh, um, I'll uh, chime in about the creation stories and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not um, I don't know. I tend to know all of the creation stories. I just know that um, whenever I talk to my husband and we learn about different other tribal nations and different cultures, um, each uh, nation usually has their own origination story of how they got here where they came from um and that goes for other cultures like European cultures you know at one time they were tribes um the same with um Asian tribes you know they all have their origination stories of how they got there um and it kind of ties into you know like um the Christianity the Bible because those are stories too it's it's just whether they um choose to accept that story or not and so um again it's with science and in uh just nature and, and trying to bridge those divides and you know i try not to get involved in those but i do believe that everybody has their story and when they tell it to me you know i accept that gift that they're giving me so um and i don't i don't want to dispute that um, so to that end, I, I think that the way Crystal approaches that is exactly right. You know, we honor and respect the individual beliefs of people, regardless of who they are, if they're native, if they're non-native. Um, you know, I don't disparage my Christian students by with my thoughts about whether or not there was an Adam and Eve in a Garden of Eden. And I certainly would never do that to somebody else. And I don't think we should. Um, these claims are usually to challenge, right, indigenous um land rights and whether or not indigenous people even have a right to the land that was taken from them. Um, and I think that usually this is sort of an example of science or people taking science and wanting to use science to further colonialism. And, and I mean, like, I don't know, I can't speak for all indigenous people, of course, but, you know, for most of us do hold that migration is a human right and migration is a beautiful thing. Um, and, and these, this pushback against indigenous people and whether or not they, you know, were always here. Um, I think it's also anti-migration in many ways, anti-immigration in many ways, and it doesn't change the fact, you know, no matter what our origin stories are, that we still suffered under first European and then U.S. colonialism. Um, and so I think challenging, you know, the land, the whole land bridge thing, and I've, I have never met, I don't know if this is other people's experiences, but I have never had to defend who I am so much to, to people all the time, nonstop, constantly. I sat next to a woman once at an event who told me that Hawaiians didn't exist anymore um, even, and, and that was appalling to me. Um, but those claims are usually, I think, meant to like, undermine any, any of our feelings. It's a gaslighting in a way, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, We have our origin stories, we know who we are and where we came from, and any attempt to, to dismantle that or to discourage that is usually an attempt to excuse the, the colonial violence our people's experienced um, and to, you know, to, to prevent us from moving forward with the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Um, anybody else want to chime in on this? We have another big question here we can drop on the panel. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll read this one. And if you want to jump back to one of the other topics, that's totally fine as well. So the question here reads is, what are your thoughts on people commercializing indigenous practices slash cultures, uh, like smudging, having spirit animals, having dream catchers, etc.? Do you think it's a form of microaggression slash colonialism? Would it be more appropriate to support indigenous owned shops that sell herb bundles, dream catchers, etc.? Or do you think this also contributes to commercializing and might undermine the culture? I am wondering how to support indigenous movements, increase awareness and education of the culture without contributing to erasure. Smiley face. Um, I will just give my opinion and this is just my opinion. So when indigenous people were moved, when we were colonized, when we were assimilated and told we couldn't practice our religion, we couldn't speak our language and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I take offense to 
things like that. You know, we didn't get those rights back until 1978, but like the Boy Scouts, they did native ceremonies and they had um, appropriated the cultures and they wore the feathers and they wore regalia and they were allowed to do that. But indigenous people were, you know, killed for doing that stuff, put in prison, um, things like that. So I do find that offensive. And the same thing now, um, those practices were stolen from us and we were beat into submission to not practice those religions, whether we were smudging or speaking our language or making dream catchers, because all of those things were medicine to us. And now you see white um, people practicing that. They're, they have their spirit animals or they, um, you know, stump their toe and get a vision or, I mean, just types of things that were taken. I just feel that they're taken for granted and they're, they're making money off of it when, you know, most native people are in poor tribal communities or on the reservations and they're not having um, the sustenance or the generational wealth to help them get out of this generational poverty that's been forced upon them. And, you know, I, you know, I see like, um, there's this one woman that I see that she's has a website and she's charging $300 for a spiritual journey. When those things are usually medicine to people and you take time to take those journeys. So I, I do find a problem with that. And I just think people, um, romanticize the culture like, um, Amanda was saying, and, and uh, Melissa was saying, and Desiree, that, you know, people romanticize, romanticize these things, but they don't actually live the experience. So th that's just my opinion and my two cents. Um, so yeah, anybody else? Um, I'll take this topic too. Um, I wanted to offer that there are some times where it is not necessarily inappropriate. Um, in, in our native cultures, and I, I'm going to give an example of your husband, <laughs> Crystal, because he's a singer and he often sings many songs from um, outside of his own like personal culture of his birth, you know, of what his actual ancestry is. But he was given those songs. And that's a big practice within native communities is is learning from a teacher. Um, so there are non-natives who often spend a lot of time, maybe they marry into a culture or they've spent time learning from a teacher um, songs or dances or other ceremonies. Um, and they've been given permission. <laughs> the, the key word here is permission um, from the community to um, practice those ceremonies or sing or whatever <laughs> cultural um, practice they're doing. They've been given permission. And I think it's important to understand that Native people have never looked at something like intellectual property <laughs> as intellectual property of an individual. These things are communally owned by our communities, not by individuals. So the idea of somebody patenting it or taking a medicine and then saying, I'm marketing this and I'm going to make a personal profit is not like a concept that is within Indigenous communities for us to say that that, like that that is acceptable and that is why there's so much resistance is the idea of holding these things as sacred and not for profit um so when like there's an example of what crystal had shared is that you know we of, of a woman who's charging for ceremonies that we consider that this should never be something that you charge for you have to learn you have to go on these journeys you have to put in the work it devalues that those ceremonies. Um, I know I'll give a personal, something that frustrates me, and I'd love to hear Ms. Joni's perspective on this because um, it's something that I see a lot, but um, is this idea of um, using like Navajo, um, I think they call it often like a birth um, celebration or ceremony, and it's become very trendy and popular. And I and then people tell me, oh, yes, I have very good intentions, you know. And I said, well, I'm an indigenous person. I'm not Navajo. I would never do that because I that is not my culture, you know. And I haven't been taught that ceremony. So if I wouldn't do it, that means you shouldn't, because again, you're ch you're taking it, you're changing it, and then that's like decreasing its its sacredness almost it's it's spirituality um and that's part of our beliefs is that if you change it and it's not continually practiced that way that it'll start to lose its meaning um so it is like to me that is an assault on what we have left because so much as crystal and others um on this panel have talked about so much was taken and stolen it was illegal 
legal for our, our ancestors and even some of our family members, remember, to even practice these things. And now that we are going through this cultural revitalization, it's really challenging <laughs> to figure out how to get that back and to keep it in its form where that is still a sacred practice for us. So um, that's just some of my perspective on that. Um, I, I like Crystal, I'm also an indigenous seed keeper. And that's another thing that has been often stolen from us is like our seeds, and then we see them marketed. Um, but of course, indigenous people also have the challenge of having to make a living within our current society. So we have this same um, challenge of like, what can we sell? What can we offer, you know, and support ourselves um, and make this like something that's long lasting because, you know, we, you need money to do that. You actually need money to do cultural revitalization. So it is a really important discussion and a hard um, concept to figure out that equal balance and how to do these things in respectful ways. Um, thank you so much for that question. It's, um, I, I love to hear from others too. Yeah, just to um, go off what everyone said, like, yeah, I, I personally um, just think of like, when individuals do like buy these certain items like dream catchers like sage bundles um and they have not consulted any like indigenous tribal community um to say to learn the process of harvesting those like ethically and culturally and to learn the significance of those particular um items i think it's really important that instead of just being so extractive of these items and reselling um, native made items and native inspired items, they should also acknowledge the histories along with those items, um, spreading awareness, the truth of like where these items came from and also like the tribal communities that they collaborated with. Cause I think that's really important because nowadays um, you just see all these um, like like the, like it was mentioned, like people selling sage bundles, um, people like alternating different ceremonial activities, um, and that's just not right. And like they're they're just causing all this harm to the indigenous people. They think they're uplifting and they're respecting, like their perception of supporting native people um, is kind of like deteriorate it because of stereotypical norms and how society portrays indigenous people. Um, I think that's also a key thing in understanding how people um, go about selling these different things and also sometimes like sacred. Um, and a lot of times I would see different items within like Southwestern homes have baskets, have pottery, have different native um, jewelries and they may have no idea where they came from. They may have no idea who made it, um, the significance of it. Um, and I think like, if you're an individual who has those items, go out and do your research, go out and find um, what it means, and then actually share that with people who ask you about that item. Don't just say like, oh, some Native American made that. Like, no, you're basically <laughs> like enforcing that violence and that silence of indigenous people and really just kind of grouping us up in one big thing when we're not we're all like different we all have our own language we all have a culture and when people go out and just say oh this is native american made like they're just like grouping us all together and that's just not okay and um it's just frustrating but it's also really important to talk about um all of that too so it's very appreciative of like all of you spreading that and just doing this work of really just breaking down these barriers and creating a difference on how um, different indigenous people are seen and just spreading the truth of like the histories and the significance of, of our stories and just how important it is of like keeping that alive for generation and generation to come. I think I would also offer the quick, uh, and when in doubt, like this question, for example, is, is also saying, how can we support? Right? And I think when in doubt, buy from Native and Indigenous people. And usually, particularly if it's in like a, a legit space, like at powwows or different places like on the internet that, that are legit websites, Native people aren't going to sell sacred things that don't, that shouldn't be used by non-Native people. 
and they're usually going to explain to you. You're also going to be empowering those people to continue to keep making art or, you know, fashion, whatever it is that they're doing. So when in doubt, buy from native people and they're, they're, they're usually not going to steer you in the right, in the wrong direction. Right. So don't go on eBay. Don't go to random, you know, flea markets and buy stuff there because that's when you start to get into those very dangerous places. Um, so yeah. Would anybody else like to chime in on that one? I, we have one uh, last question here that I'll be asking and then we'll kind of wrap it up. So does anybody else want to chime in on that before we change shift gears? Okay, so the last thing I'll, the last thing I'll say before we head off is actually that uh, this is the last webinar that the Department of History is doing for this semester, but we will be continuing with these in the fall. So please uh, keep an eye out for those. If you are on our list, we'll, we'll send you more info on those when they come. And the last question that we'll have for you all is for the people watching either the recording or that are still here with us uh, right now, um, let's say non-Native people, non-Indigenous people, what, is, what do you all think is the most important thing they should take home with them today or keep at home with them today about Native peoples? one quick thing briefly i suppose uh so we can start we'll go we'll start out with uh or who would like to start i'll start and i think okay. um Nijoni, um you've done such an amazing job today i'm so proud of you and i'm gonna miss you so much when you graduate this semester <laughs> um i'm not i'm not gonna get mushy but i think Nijoni um so eloquently said um a lot of the education is understanding that indigenous people are not a monolith um you know, this this notion that there's a monolithic native culture is a myth. And so I think you have to take the time to learn about the native um, peoples that exist in your area. And there's all kinds of wonderful um, websites. If somebody will drop it in the chat, um, learn about the native people that exist in your local surroundings. Start there first and understand the diversity among those folks. And I think that will help to um, educate people on some of the complexities. I talk about this a lot and I cite um, Brian Brayboy, who is a Lumpy scholar in my work. Um, and he talks about tribal, tribal critical race theory. And you first have to understand indigenous peoples as um, a political identity, not just race and ethnicity. Some people like myself show up as white privilege because my father's family is native and my mother's family is white. Um, people are not always going to show up in these stereotypical or recognizable ways, but you have to understand that as a political identity just as much as it is um, maybe race, ethnicity, or culture, because these communities have unique relationships to state and federal governments. Um, and so I'll let someone else speak. We can go to Crystal. Um, just one good takeaway is um, remember that they are still indigenous people and like Melissa was saying that um, often different uh, people, different indigenous people come in different colors, and we're not all Hollywood stereotypes so we're not all going to have long black hair and looking like iron eyes Cody with the teardrop coming down. Um, we are still here and we're still thriving so that's my, my one takeaway for everybody. Uh, Amanda Lee. Yeah, I would just echo what people have said. Not only do we need to learn, or non-natives probably need to learn how to see Indigenous people, um, be mindful of the fact that your entire education and curriculum and much of your history has been about unseeing them. Um, and that if you feel like something that, that Native people are telling you now you cannot you know, practice or is not part of your culture is part of your culture, then you need to think about the violence that accompanied that. Um, you know, Chris's example earlier of the Boy Scouts was a great one. Um, and certainly when people want to say that like luau's and and things are part of their 1950s culture, they're not. They're part of my culture. Um, think about the violence that was enacted against colonial or, or against people who, that were colonized. Colonization is extractive. Um, that then gave you um, that sense of this is this is mine. Um, listen to indigenous people, see indigenous people. They're here and they're almost often telling you what they need from you know, non-indigenous allies. Uh, Desiree? Um, I'll take the perspective of a um, community organizer activist and ask people to show up as good accomplices rather than just allies um, and understanding um, what that difference is. Um, so often we see that people may um, co-opt or <laughs> jump onto a movement like Water is Life or um, the No Dapple movement or 
um, and you know, and they and they use it often in environment in environmental movements. Um, but sometimes you don't see those same people um, coming up, jumping up to be accomplices in a land back <laughs> um, movement. So I what I'm what I'm suggesting is that. Um, being a good accomplice means also showing up for not just indigenous communities, but you know any BIPOC community or um, commu or social rights movement that may be outside of your comfort zone or um, or your normal um, activism work um, to show up for these intersectional issues and really engage in meaningful ways with indigenous communities um, so that you are not mobilizing them in your direction of what you want, but that you are really listening and hearing what they need and that you are, and that you are advocating for what those communities need. Um, so that would be my last thing. Thank you. And we'll go with Njoni. And before I let you uh, say your piece, uh, I'll tell our, our viewers that uh, I don't think we mentioned this yet, but Njoni is finishing up here and she's going to be going to the University of Arizona to start her PhD program in the fall. So Bear Down, that's a fantastic institution to go to, particularly for PhD. So you, you can't go wrong there. And uh, please tell us what your, your piece is. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Polanco, for that. Um, super excited for that. Uh, I just wanted to express just like how important it is to speak up for indigenous communities in spaces where we're not even welcomed, in spaces that we may not feel or have the privilege of taking up when we are trying to reclaim so much that has been taken from us. Um, even that could be like in the classroom when they talk about um, different colonial practices um, you could you could say, well, what about the indigenous perspective? Like, did you work with indigenous people? Did you consult? Like, how was this research done? Like, you can um, be that person to raise your voice on the inclusion of indigenous people and how important it is to include their voices and perspectives and histories within like all aspects of society. And um, I think that really would help like bring awareness to like. Native people are still here. And although we may not be in all the spaces and sitting at all the tables, you have the opportunity to like raise your voice and to be that person to raise awareness to indigenous people. Although we may not be there or welcome those spaces, you can change that um, by doing those little um, acts of like encouragement and being courageous in that way. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and uh, with that, on, on behalf of the Department of History and uh, the American Indian and Indigenous Community Center at Virginia Tech, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Also, all of our panelists and speakers today, thank you so much for spending this time with us and, and educating us and sharing your knowledge. It's been fantastic, and I'm sure everyone has loved it. I, I opened up the chat box to everyone. If you guys want to send some love to, this, to the speakers, please, please do so at this moment. And uh, thank you also to Melissa Faircloth, who's been doing so much uh, for the Native community here on campus uh, for time immemorial almost, it seems, but definitely this last year during COVID lockdown. So thank you so much and thank you all. And we will see you all very soon uh, in the fall with our next uh, webinar. Thank you. <laughs>